Hey guys, welcome back to Medical Coding with Blue. Okay, it is Q&A Tuesday. Well, technically it's a pre-record. <laughs> I will be out and about tomorrow, so I wanted to make sure that this got uploaded at a decent hour, so decent hour it is. <laughs> I got a lot of really good questions over the last week. Um, some of this is also going to be my response to some of the emails that I've gotten. Uh, this is just so you guys to, can know my thoughts about some things, some of these topics. So. Let's go ahead and get into the questions. All right, number one, can I bypass through a program for medical coding, study on my own, and take the certification exam? With AHIMA, or the American Health Information Management Association, yes, you can. Um, all that is required to take the CCA, or the Certified Coding Associate, is a high school diploma or a GED, okay? Now, with uh, AAPC and the CPC exam, it is my understanding from the website, okay, because I went to the website today, all right? <laughs> I went to the website, and they said that you can take the CPCA exam uh, by going through one of their programs or, or like one of these schools that offer a program that models themselves after them, um, or you can have years of experience. So it's, it's either or, okay? Uh, but check with both associations, okay, if you're not sure. Uh, but with AHIMA, yes, you can. Just um, know that if you're going to study on your own, it's, a, it's a quite an undertaking. It is not impossible, but it is an undertaking. So these are some of the books that you're going to need. Uh, this is just a, just a rough idea of what you're going to need. And for the coding books, you need the current year, okay? Go with the current year because it's going to serve you best, all right? Um, you'll need an ICD-10 CM expert for physicians the latest year. You'll need a current procedural terminology, the professional edition, okay? Because remember, there's professional and there's expert. You want to get the professional edition, especially if you're going to be sitting for a, um, a HEMA credential exam. So uh, that, and then a HCPCS, -HC HCPCS, it's always a good thing to have this so you can study and know what it is. This book houses all of the uh, HCPCS codes for like durable medical equipment and bandages, things like that, so on and so forth. Okay, uh, a medical dictionary, an evaluation and management workbook, and you can see uh, the website Optum360, which I'll be leaving the link down in the description box below. Optin360 has lots of good reference books to help medical coders. I love this website. It's like a candy store. But I have to be very, very careful <laughs> going on this website because there are so many good books. Um, and if you want to become a, be a better medical coder, this is a very good site to visit because it has all of the coding companions as well. So lots of good things to look for on that website but you can get an evaluation and management uh, workbook, okay, um, on there. At least that's what I saw last time. So get that if you're trying to study on your own, it'll serve you best, okay. Uh, get a practice exam book. The CCA has a practice exam book. It has the, um, it has like questions and it has the answers. So get yourself one of those. Um, anatomy, physiology books, pathophysiology books, pathology books. Uh, reimbursement for medical billing books, HIPAA, you got to know that stuff forward and backwards, medical ethics and law, medical terminology and medical abbreviations book. There are many resources listed on AHIMA as well. Um, and AHIMA does not allow tabbing in their books. Okay. So if you're going to sit for an AHIMA credential exam, your books cannot be tabbed. Okay. I know AAPC has their thing about that and they allow it, but AHIMA, the books have to be clean, okay? It's just the way that it is, all right? Uh, and what I mean by clean is that there's no tabs on these, okay? Um, the second one is, with technical elements such as the encoder, do you think it would be best to become something other than just a coder, such as a medical assistant, a biller, etc. along with being a coder. The education is different for um, a medical assistant. The same thing with being a biller. Okay, so the a medical biller does not have to have the technical knowledge that a medical coder has to have. Okay, they deal with something different. Medical billers are often not certified. 
They do not have to have a certification to to be a medical biller, okay? Um, they just have to have an understanding of, of how to submit claims because that's essentially all they're doing is submitting claims. Uh, they may kick it back to the medical coder because a medical biller and a medical coder can be the same person, but it can also be two different people, okay? Um, and like I said, billers do not have to be certified medical coders, which I think it would be better if they did, you know, so at least that way they can understand and know what they're going through. Um, but they don't have to be, okay? Uh, so with that in mind, uh, it's just a different level of, of, of education that has to be for the billers and for medical assistants. Uh, obviously, the pay range is not the same, okay? Because we have to have technical knowledge as medical coders, it's different for medical billers. Please do not ask me about money and who makes what. You can go to the Department of Labor um, .gov and they will be able to answer that question for whatever profession you are looking for in your area and as well as the outlook uh, for, for the profession as well. Uh, I have a golden rule on my channel. I do not talk about money. I do not talk about money because so many people see the amount of money that coders make and they want to get into it simply for the money. And I have always discouraged this because this is not a field that you should go into because of the money. You should go into it because you like, um, doing research, you like doing, uh, you're very detail oriented. That's very important. Um, I think that every coder should try to at least attempt to be a high caliber coder. I think that is very, very important. We get paid very well, but we have to earn this money. And it's a responsibility that I think sometimes gets downplayed, especially when people are trying to recruit people in to become medical coders. And that's where I always say, I don't talk about money because of that reason. Um, because I don't want to be partied in that. Well, she said I can make this. No, 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 no. I want it to be, well, she said it's this much work. <laughs> I'm ready. Okay. That's what I want people to say. Okay. If they're going to say anything about me and my channel, it's going to be that she doesn't talk about money. She talks about <laughs> what all it entails. Okay. She's very detailed. That's what I want to hear. <laughs> so anyway, but yes, that's, that's my golden rule. Okay. Uh, the next question, um, talk about where my drive for medical coding comes from. So lots of people have noticed that I am very, uh, driven when it comes to medical coding and that I'm very involved and very passionate about it. Where does this come from? Where does my drive come from? My drive comes from years of trial and error. It comes from years of learning. It comes from years of developing into a better coder, into a higher caliber coder, okay? I am constantly trying to push myself to learn and do more and do better because I feel like if I learn and do more and do better, others around me can benefit from that. My providers have benefited from it. Other coders that I work with that come and ask me questions have benefited from it. So for me uh, personally, it is a it is always going to be a goal to just keep keep on keep on keep on. And when I reach these goals, when I reach certain milestones, I am it just gives me such a sense of pride, and I feel like uh, for me, I'm I feel like I'm making my mom proud every time I do something even better than the last time I've did it. So that's, that's another motivator for me. When I hear providers, when they've gone from hating me and, and not wanting to see me and I don't want to deal with you to, Oh blue, how are you? I'm so glad to see you. <laughs> I have a question. When I get that, it's even, it motivates me even more. So that's where my motivation comes from. My motivation comes from sharing with others and and just having that drive to to get better and it's not just about me it's not about me that's the most important thing that i that i stress if if anybody asks me it's not about me it is always about others it is about doing good for others there's 
that's basically all I can say about that. That's where my drive comes from. Um, that's what inspires me when I see uh, people that work hard, these providers that they work so hard and, and I'm inspired and I'm moved by um, some of them because of what they do and the passion that they have for their craft and the fact that they take care of their patients so well. What can I do to assist with that? And then I say, well, I'm a medical coder. I can try to be the best damn medical coder that I that I can be. That's all I can do. So that's where my drive and my inspiration comes from. So different people have different different uh, different inspiration, but that's mine. And so that's that's what drives me, and that's what makes me happy. <laughs> So, all right, next, next one. Um, uh, when you are applying for medical coding jobs, you do have to pass a background check as well as a drug screen. Sometimes people can't pass either and then they're unable to get a job. So um, listening to the rhetoric of I can't find a job, there's a percentage of those that can't pass a background check or a drug screen uh, many factors go into why some are not finding jobs. So that's one thing I wanted to bring up too. When I was getting interviewed at a job that I had gotten, um, they did ask me, you know, everything sounds great, Blue. We're very excited to have you. Um, we're looking forward to meeting you. But can you pass a drug screen? And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> why? Why would you ask that? And then she was like, well, I'm just, I, I've just been encountering so many people who can't pass a drug screen and we can't hire them. And I'm like, really? Wow. You know what I mean? Because you have to be, you have to be of sound mind when you are working with these records. So that's why you need to be drug free. Okay. Uh, and sometimes with, if you have a criminal past, it doesn't necessarily count you out. You all know that. Um, but it depends on what your crime was, how long ago was it adjudicated, and there's a lot of things that go into it, but you have to be honest because they are going to find it out when they do your background check. And trust me, they do the background checks. <laughs> I, I know that they do for a fact that they do background checks. I've been background checked many times, so I know. And, and very, people are very thorough, especially when you are going to be around a lot of sensitive information. Okay. We are around people's medical records. We are around so much information and it is a great responsibility. So that's why you have to be, you have to make sure that everything is, is lining up. So, uh, again, if you, if you've had a criminal past and things like that, or if it's been adjudicated, you need to at least explain and, and let the people that you're applying with know. Okay. So that's that's it on that one. Uh, the next one is talk about discouraging versus a reality check. Okay, so a couple of people <laughs> said that uh, they felt discouraged that what I had said discouraged them, uh, but they thanked me because you know it was like um, it was more of like I kept them from making a mistake. Okay. It's not so much that I'm discouraging people, it's a reality check, okay? It's more than anything else, it's a reality check because uh, sometimes when, especially when these recruiters are trying to get people into medical coding school, they don't always talk about all this other stuff like I do. I am very detailed, so that's just the way that I am. I mean, like I said, when it comes to people and, and whether or not they're gonna get into the field or not, I mean, I'm just giving you the information that I wished somebody would have given me when I started. Okay. So, uh, not that it would have changed my mind because I just, I just went with it. You know, that's, that's how I felt at the time. And if I was to go back and do it again, I would do the same thing again. You know, so it's not that I'm trying to discourage anybody. Please don't think I'm trying to discourage you guys. I'm just giving you a reality check. Okay. Uh, I want you guys to know everything that's involved. All right. So that way that you are aware because uh, there are some predatory schools. Now, let's just be honest. We all know that there are some predatory schools out there that will take your money. They will gladly take your money and they will sell you a dream. They will sell you medical coding. And I'm not here to sell it to you. I'm here to be real with you and I will continue to be real with you. Okay, so again, please don't think I'm trying to discourage you. I'm just trying to give you facts. 
and let you know. Okay. So um, the next one is number seven. If our government takes on national a national health care system, will that drastically cut down the need for medical coders? Absolutely not. Uh, the insurance company has nothing to do with, well, it does have something to do with medical coding, but um, the uh, medical coders also are responsible for the statistical things, okay? Um, the numbers of, of diseases and things like that, of procedures that are being done and things like that. There's a lot of data that we're responsible for. So it's not just the insurance part. And as I mentioned before, a couple days ago, um, there are some entities that are self-contained. I mean, they're their own medical ecosystem, okay? The prisons, there are some children's hospitals like that are like this. There are um, some uh, research hospitals that are also like this that they don't bill out to insurance companies, but they still have to be, uh, they still have to have coders in order to gather that data and, and still be able to code out what was performed or what, conditions were treated and things like that. So there, there's all that. So this, this whole thing about Medicare for all and it taking away our jobs, that's said by somebody that does not know anything about the medical coding field, okay? HIM is a huge, huge thing. It is very big. Uh, but again, it's, it's, not gonna, it's not gonna take it away. So just put that one to bed. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, and the next one, uh, do you see the medical coding field becoming automated or at least automated to a point that it cuts down on the need for medical coders? No. Now there has been the advent of uh, obviously the encoder in the last decade or so to two decades. I don't know. I don't know when the encoder came out. <laughs> um, all I know is it was already there when I was <laughs> uh, when I was coding. But I know for a long time people were using the book. Okay, so there there was the advent of the encoder just to make it um, better for production and things like that. But when it comes to like uh, all this other stuff like artificial intelligence, we're not so advanced that we. Um, that we don't need the human element to be looking at medical records, okay? We still have to have that human touch because the computer is only smart as you're gonna tell it to be. And it only goes in by what is put in it. It's data, data-based and, and word-driven and things like that, okay? We are the human eyes and we can see, all right? So we're gonna be able to interpret this a lot more differently than a computer will. So, no, I don't think that we are going to see any of that. And no, I don't think so. Okay. Uh, next question. What is the career outlook and the income range for a medical coder? Again, my golden rule. We don't talk about money on this channel. <laughs> uh, you can go to the Department of Labor at dol.gov for all of that information because, as I've said before, Every place in the U.S. is going to start their coders off at a different rate. And there are many different factors that go into the starting rates at different facilities. Is this a state-run facility? Is this a government-run facility? Is this a private institution? Is this a doctor's office? Is this a company? Is this a contract? There are so many things that go into what the starting, where their jumping off point is. So again, going to the department of labor.gov will help you. Okay. And the next one is if the description of the procedure code states that this is a bilateral procedure that is being performed, do you still have to add modifier 50? No, you don't because it already states in the description that it's a bilateral code. So you do not have to put a modifier 50 on it. Uh, you can look in Appendix A of the CPT Professional Edition to view the official reference and it does state it under the description for modifier 50, okay? So next question, do you answer emails? <laughs> of course, of course I answer emails. Uh, I answer all the emails that come in um, unless it is, it is a question that I have answered uh, a lot or I can point them to a uh, video, then I will respond with that. So um, 
But yes, I do uh, answer all my emails. I sometimes I do take a minute to to get back to you because of the signal in my office. Sometimes I don't get signal and sometimes I have to step out. So I will go out on a break sometimes. It depends on how busy I am. Uh, but sometimes I'll take a break and go run outside and, and get a signal and, and be able to find out who, who's emailed me. But I will get back to you if you email me. All right. Um, and the last one. Do not send me resumes. <laughs> Please do not send me resumes. There is absolutely nothing I can do with anybody's resume. Okay. I, um, I come on here. We talk about medical coding. I talk about other little things and things like that, but I can't, I can't, I can't vouch for you. I can't, I can't give your email. I can't give your resume to anybody. So really you're, you're wasting your time if you give it to me. Okay. Uh, there's nothing that I can do with it anyway. I mean, there's nothing <laughs> literally i i'm not in charge of hiring you know and um if you were to ask me who's hiring i don't know because i'm not looking for a job okay and then i did have one more question so the question that came in um shortly ago was if if a coder goes out on leave is there somebody else that covers down for that coder or is it just um catch up when you can or or what's the deal so for me and my facility, if if I'm out, I'm out and that backlog is just going to pile up because um, there is some relief. There is a relief pitcher <laughs> basically that runs around, um, but she is tasked to do a lot of different things. So this which is why I try not to take a lot of time off. Um, there have been people that have been out for surgery and sometimes my supervisor will ask, hey, can you can you lend a hand? And I'll say sure, because I, I learned long ago, you never say no, okay? Especially when it comes to medical coding, you always want to try to have every opportunity to learn and to grow and to do what you can, okay? So we're all in it together. So that's why I'm always willing to help. Um, but for the most part, you know, uh, coders are on their own um, when they are out, unless you have a partner. And uh, we've we've had this discussion before <laughs> where I did have a partner and I did ask her if um, she wanted me to what dates was she going to be out so I could take over for those dates. And she refused to give me that information because she was upset because our supervisor did not have a plan in place. Well, I'm here with you. We're partners. This is our clinic. Uh, we should be able to uh, come up with a plan ourselves. We're adults and we're not kids and we don't need to be directed in that way. We could have handled this between me and you, but she didn't want to do that. And so literally she had to go on leave <laughs> and, you know, we had to get a key to open up the cabinet that had all the records in it so that we, I could go through and see what was needing to be done. And of course it was all of the hard stuff that needed to be done or the technical hard stuff, which was fine. I, we still got it done anyway, me and the relief pitcher. But, you know, it, it wasn't it wasn't anything that had to do with her. I mean, she she made it difficult for for me and the relief pitcher. So it was like, OK, you know, but for me, I, I will always pitch in and help. No questions asked. OK, so that's going to do it for me. <laughs> uh, but that is Q&A Tuesday. So if you have any more questions, let me know. I am going to be working on the part two of the um, of the table of risk box. Uh, I just haven't had a chance to do it, uh, but I will get around to it. So table of risk box is coming up, a demonstration of looking up the CPT codes and the ICD-10 codes um, is also coming up because people have asked to do it back to the basics. So I'm gonna go back to the back to the basics again and do that. So. I got a few more shows lined up I'm very excited about too. So I'm going to go ahead and wrap this one up. But if you are a medical coder, a medical coding student, somebody curious about the fascinating world of medical coding, a provider or a nurse, I invite you to like and subscribe and follow me on my journey in medical coding. I will see y'all tomorrow. Bye.